Yeah. Thanks everybody for showing up to our second meetup of uh, Nixio Bugs and Rustio Engines. Uh, this is our schedule for today. I'm starting with the greeting now. Then we're hearing a talk by Enola, right here, of their usage of Rust at the German Cancer Research Center. Then we will have another talk about Nix for monorepositories by me. And finally, we're getting together to talk about Nix, Rust, what your interest, uh, interests in this topic are, what you want to do with Nix and Rust, whatever you want to learn. If you're adventurous, we can set up NixOS on your laptop right here, right now. But <laughs> we don't have to get too crazy. Drinks are on us. You can select the profile for the meetup uh, right to the fridge, scan your drink, and then take it with you here. We will have a small break between Enola's and my talk. So there will pl be plenty of time to get something to drink in between and also to get to the toilet, etc. Our last meetup and our first of the series was last December in Heidelberg, uh, together with the EMCL of Heidelberg University. We had 24 participants in total, two talks. The first one was about an introduction to Nix by Vanessa, and the second was about scripting Rust applications with JavaScript, Python, and Lua. Our next meetup after this one is going to be on April 29th, again in Heidelberg, at the Engineering Mathematics and Computing Lab in Heidelberg. And yeah, I would be happy to see some more of your faces again there. Finally, you can find us on the web on Mastodon, nixrust at reinecker.social, on mobilizor, reinecker.event slash at nix underscore rust, with a metrics channel if you want to talk about the topics presented here today, or nix and rust in general. And finally, if you have any ideas for a talk or questions for the talks that you hear today, you can write them by email to nixrust at reinecker.events. Uh, unlike the last meetup, uh, this one uh, is under the umbrella of two non-profit associations. The first one being Raumzeitlabor, which hosts this meetup today. The second one being Hackerstolz, uh, an association from Mannheim that focuses on teaching programming and technology. I joined them in January and I would be happy if some of you would look into it. If you maybe find that you would like help organizing meetups or generally courses uh, for teaching programming, teaching about Nix, Rust, or any other technology that excites you, or even data privacy, etc. Um, membership is free for students, as we're looking to establish Hacker Stolz as, um, as a student initiative in Heidelberg University and Mannheim University. So if uh, money is a blocker for you, don't worry about it. And now we're hearing the first talk today by Enola. Uh, or should we wait four minutes? <laughs> okay. This was much faster than I anticipated. Let's get you set up and then I think we're ready oh, for the I clock. Should. Okay. Uh, hi all, I'm Enola. Uh, I work uh, in uh, Martin Lublin's research group in German Cancer Research Center and University Hospital Mannheim with those complicated names. And uh, we have our lead Rust uh, developer here, Jan, also. And uh, today uh, we're going to tell you how we use Rust in uh, cancer research uh, to protect the uh, privacy of patients. So we do central searches for biospecimens and for patient data. Uh, and we protect uh, patients' privacy in uh, several ways. First of all is that uh, the data of uh, patients, uh, actually uh, individual data never leaves the uh, biobanks or the data stores, only aggregated data uh, gets to the central search. We use uh, pseudonymized uh, patient data, and uh, we also obfuscate those aggregated results. So when we search here on the right side, you have a sample of a, a search tree uh, where you can set uh, certain uh, data by which you want to search patients' data. Uh, you can. What it can be uh, data about the patient, so it can be diagnosis, age of uh, the donor, uh, it can be data about the sample, it can be genomic data, it can be mutations, uh, it can be storage temperature. When we search for it, we only get aggregated data, so 
now I apologize, I had to obfuscate this a bit more. So all our data is first obfuscated, then it's rounded, and then, uh, because not everybody here uh, has access uh, to life science uh, AAI, I actually had to also blur the names of the sites, which are the cities where we have biobanks and uh, also the numbers of patients and the numbers of specimens. But I'm going to show a bit. I'm going to show the part that I'm allowed to show in a live demo later. Um, so uh, we have uh, certain stratifiers which show the total data, uh, age distribution specimens, but no individual data is visible. This is um, our. Uh, central search, which is called Lens. It is made in Angular, but right now it is being rewritten in Svelte, so stay tuned. Uh, this is another example from another project, uh, just to show you how things can be uh, differently arranged in Lens. And we have multiple projects. First of all, it is German Biobank node, uh, which uh, scientists can use to find the biospecimens uh, by certain criteria in biobanks in Germany. But then also we have the uh, same thing, uh, European-wide, which is BPMRI ERIC, and uh, it also includes biobanks from Italy, Sweden, uh, Cyprus, Czechia, and we have other biobanks who are eager to join. Then we have DECATECA, this is German Cancer Consortium, and it serves uh, to uh, facilitate uh, uh, development of new treatments, uh, translation of uh, research data into uh, new treatments. DECATECA is German-wide and it uses clinical communication platform. And then we have the same thing on European level, which is Cancer Core Europe. And because in children, cancer are a bit uh, different than in adults, they manifest differently and children usually get different types of cancer. There's uh, another project, ITCC, uh, which uh, actually uh, serves to facilitate the uh, development of new treatments for uh, pediatric cancers. And on the map, uh, right? Now, <laughs> this is supposed to be a map of Germany, but it seems that gray color is the same as uh, white color. You can see uh, different uh, biobanks and uh, data stores that exist in different uh, cities in Germany for uh, different projects. And another project uh, we have, this is for uh, imaging data. So uh, MRI, uh, CT scan, uh, PET scan. Uh, it's a central search uh, and uh, it is a uh, intended to be used for AI processing of medical imaging. So uh, this is simplified architecture of uh, uh, our central search, federated search. So it works this way. So this is lens where oh, yeah, you don't see the cursor. OK, so. The researcher uses web browser to access Lens, which is our front end, sets the uh, criteria and sends the query. A uh, query is sent to Lens back end, which is actually called spot. So uh, later I'm going to uh, show QR codes for our projects and for our organization in GitHub. So you can use it to access it. Uh, so this Lens backend is called Spot. Right now we still have Spot in Java running in some places, but it is getting uh, replaced by uh, Rust Spot. And then there is Beam. Beam is a distributed task broker, uh, which is made to solve problems with uh, data protection concepts that we have in Germany. And in this uh, image, actually, um, beams are beam proxies. Uh, each application uses a beam proxy. And uh, this uh, central uh, padlock, this is actually beam. So Lens Backend sends a task to beam, uh, a task to certain sites. Here we have site A, site B, site C. These are actually cities, university hospitals, biobanks, uh, or uh, some other uh, data stores. And then 
when uh, sites periodically ask, each beam proxy on each site periodically asks central component beam, do you have a task for me? Then beam says, yeah, I have a task for you. Then uh, focus, which is a distributed task broker, gets the task, runs it against the store that uh, is set by the project name or by a parameter. Here it is Blaze, it is Firestore. Fire is a standard in uh, medical informatics, but it can be any type of uh, store. So uh, it can be database, uh, it can be another application. So Focus can actually run the query against another application that runs it against uh, some store. Here, uh, under Lens Backend, we have a library Laplace, which is actually used for obfuscating data. And there are some additional operations which are mostly bash scripts right now. So I said Beam is a distributed task broker. Uh, it is made to solve problems with exotic proxy configurations that we have in hospitals. Um, some of them only allow outbound connection and Beam is dealing with encryption and with certificate management itself, which means that applications themselves that use Beam don't have to deal with those. So if you scan a QR code, you can uh, open the uh, repository in GitHub. And then, um, yeah, uh, I was asked a few times, why not Kafka, why not uh, RabbitMQ? But uh, the thing is that um, it was considered and uh, in order to set it up, it would take uh, the same amount of time. So my colleagues have decided to write a task broker themselves. So then there was a need to transmit HTTP calls over Beam to some sites that are behind a proxy. Uh, and Beam Connect was developed, which actually uh, uses uh, Beam. It uh, wraps up that uh, method call and uh, it pretends that it is a Beam task, actually, and uh, sends it to another uh, site. Uh, Beacon is one example. Beacon is a protocol used in uh, bioinformatics for searching genomic data. And we had a situation where the store was behind a proxy and uh, the problem was solved by uh, transmitting uh, the uh, HTTP requests and responses over Beam. And then Focus. Uh, Focus is a dispatcher that takes the task, uh, runs it against the store, and then returns the results to uh, the uh, central search. CQL here means uh, clinical quality language. I know there's another uh, query language that has the same uh, acronym, but this one is specific for uh, fire actually for fire stores and it is more powerful than the fire API itself. So that's the one that we use right now. Uh, we only do certain replacements of uh, certain um, snippets of code or rather placeholders in focus so that uh, SQL injections are not possible. But uh, we're working on uh, the exact, uh, the entire translation of AST uh, into CQL and other languages. A colleague is working on translation to SQL and then some other translations are also planned. Then uh, we have uh, AST, which is translated into a slightly different type of AST for those projects for uh, medical imaging. It was supposed to be translated into SQL, but it turns out that uh, the SQLs are quite uh, specific. So in the end, they asked for a bit simplified AST than we get from the search. Uh, it uh, runs the queries and it obfuscates the result. So how does obfuscation work? First, the idea is that the patients 
actually, if the patients are sure that their data is as safe when it is in a database as if it is not in the database, that it can't be in any way deduced in which database they are, or are, are there in a certain database or not, they are going to be more likely to agree to sign the consent to have their biospecimens and their data available for research. So the problem with central search is still that uh, we have a certain rare diagnosis and we can narrow down the age uh, quite, uh, like we can search for the exact age and uh, with using other uh, specific uh, parameters it could be narrowed down. The search could be narrowed down to show one patient and in which of the biobanks uh, they are. So uh, K anonymity would mean that for a certain criterion there are at least K patients for whom uh, that criterion is true, so for whom the results are, are returned. But uh, because such an attack is possible, uh, we decided that it's not enough and that data also needs to be obfuscated, so the aggregated data. Um, now also uh, there are other attacks which could be possible, for example, uh, where a sensitive characteristic can be inferred. Uh, the example is if you know that uh, your neighbor went to a COVID hospital, then they probably had uh, COVID at, the, at that time. So um, it uh, actually, um, there's another uh, thing. Yeah, uh, anonymized data can also be de-anonymized. And there was this example, which was uh, quite uh, famous where Netflix, I think, uh, released the uh, ratings of uh, their users and uh, a group of uh, researchers managed to uh, cross-reference it with uh, image uh, data, you know, international movie database, and uh, they managed to de-anonymize the data. Uh, so there's the need for obfuscation. And then we also round the values, which I'm going to I'll explain later. So we use Laplace distribution. We sample a random value from Laplace distribution and we add it to the value and then we round the value to the nearest 10. Um, this is an example where higher values uh, are to be expected and it would uh, cause our values to be a bit more uh, distributed and a bit more over the place than, for example, if we set this parameter. So this is b equals 0 0.1 and b equals 0 0.26, which is usually chosen, but it is a trade-off. So it's a trade-off between privacy and usability of data. Um, after the researcher uh, finds some certain specimens. They use a tool called Negotiator, which was developed by our friends in Czechia. In Negotiator, they ask a person who is responsible for the biobank to have sam samples available because samples are very valuable. And once they're used up, they can be used again. So the uh, person who is responsible for uh, biosamples in the biobank will decide which research is more valuable and who uh, deserves to get the samples. And that is the reason that uh, we actually don't round, uh, if we have zero values, we don't obfuscate those values. We leave zeros and zeros as zeros so that our biobanks don't get spammed with requests for biosamples that don't exist. Now, the values delta and uh, epsilon are set. Delta is uh, supposed to be the average number of what is being obfuscated per patient. 
So if it is diagnosis, then it is the average number of diagnoses per patient, which could be three. And then if it's biosamples, it is the average number of biosamples per patient. And for patients, it is one. And epsilon is a certain uh, value that um, it is uh, just agreed upon. And I believe I use uh, 0 0.1 in biobanks for that one. So this is the library, uh, which you can actually uh, use as a crate. Um, it exists as Rust crate, and also our friends in Erlangen needed a Java library, so a colleague made a Java library. Everything can be configured, uh, so it's uh, sensitivity and privacy budget, uh, delta and epsilon. Also, what happens to values under 10? It could be that the biobank doesn't want to give out uh, the last nine samples, so values under 10 can be uh, rounded down to zero, rounded up to 10, or obfuscated in the usual way, we have chosen to round them up to 10. And this is because um, we want to uh, preserve the privacy of the patient. And this rounding, we do it because uh, focus has caching. Focus caches values for obfuscation so that the results are consistent, otherwise, each time you run a search with the same criteria, you'd get uh, different results. Uh, but the cache is uh, only in memory, which is okay because we don't update focus that uh, often. We don't uh, restart it. But if somebody could, could, if we weren't rounding it and somebody could somehow restart focus uh, repeatedly, they could get the real value by getting the average of those values. And that's why we also round the values to protect the privacy some more. A rounding step can also be set. We use 10. And uh, also uh, for zeros, uh, the obfuscation can be turned on. So this is our organization on GitHub. So you can scan the code, uh, QR code and you can get to the website and uh, if you want to fork our live demo. So this is a GBN, German Biobank Note search. And uh, here I'm not logged in, so I can show you the tree and I can actually search for some biosamples. But uh, what I'm not going to get, I'm going to get uh, the sum of all the results by all the sites. I can search for uh, C61, for example. And uh, maybe for sample type, I could search for serum or blood plasma. Okay. So here's the sum of the results, but uh, to get the results uh, by the sites, by the biobanks, I would need to log in. And we're also getting some graphs, some stratifiers with uh, gender, age distribution, and uh, specimen. So this one, <laughs> if... Um, I should just slide show from current slide. So if there are any questions, feel free to mail us. And also, if you would like to join us, uh, you can mail Claudia. She is our head of hiring. And uh, 
Jan and I are here to answer your questions. Okay. Actually, more than one question, mm -hmm. but I will start with the first. Uh, you mentioned you're using end-to-end -end encryption for Beam. You're also using HTTP. So does this mean this is just general TLS, transport layer security? Is it something like WireGuard in between, or is it the infamous roll your own crypto? Uh, Beam is young. Uh, so uh, we use uh, HTTPS uh, as well for the communication between the Beam proxy and the Beam broker. Uh, but it's basically roll your own crypto inside Beam. So uh, when you create a Beam task, the task body will also get encrypted with um, some custom encryption. I don't know off the top of my head what encryption algorithm we are using, but um, yeah, it's roll your own crypto basically for the actual data that gets encrypted. Okay, the second question, uh, is the Java library wrapping the Rust crate? Do you have no, some kind no. of, you just rewrote the library in Java? Yeah, actually the Java library was written first. The colleague wrote the Java library because uh, they asked for it. And uh, I, at first I had obfuscation in focus and then um, we got the idea to uh, separate it as a crate itself. So. And my final question, what are you using for parsing your CQL language? Is this like, are you using some existing parsing crates? Are you, you, uh, did you develop your own parsing library, something like this? Uh, no, nothing like that uh, yet. Like, we're not using GNOME. It was an idea. But uh, right now, um, I'm working on the CQL compiler, so to say, but it's not... Uh, compiler in the strict sense. It's not like uh, I'm using uh, lexical and syntax analysis and then uh, state machine and whatnot. Uh, it's just an AST tree and uh, I'm building SQL from it. But that's still in the making and uh, Lens is still sending uh, snippets of SQL. So uh, the we have uh, parts of CQL, some of them are stratifiers, which are uh, used for generating those graphs. And the other part is uh, the condition itself. So conditions they send, but definitions of stratifiers, that's something that comes from focus. So right now only uh, some snippets of codes are getting replaced. And uh, what I'm working on, we're getting uh, abstract syntax tree and uh, translating that into SQL, which is, uh, yeah, SQL is, officially it was made simple so that uh, people who are not in IT, such as nurses, can write it. But if you look at it, it's <laughs> quite complicated, <laughs> yes. So I, I don't know, you might find it interesting. But we also have uh, other languages. So a colleague is, ma uh, college, a colleague is making a translation into SQL, and then another colleague has made a translation into AQL. I'm not even sure what this one is. Then GraphQL is planned, and uh, I think we are also going to translate to Beacon uh, in focus at some point. Right now, it is done in Java spot, so Java backend of Lens. We, we had a lot of those Java components which didn't really behave well, so at some point we decided to rewrite everything in Rust and yeah, no more null pointer uh, exceptions. Uh, the application stopped crashing, everything is faster and yeah. But yes, there's still more work to do. So um, you just mentioned it with the rewrite um, of that component. Was it really 
maybe the reliability or was it developer tendency what were the, the, the drivers to rewrite everything in Rust? I guess it's quite an effort for you to do so, right? Um, uh, well, uh, I think it was more, well, Java is an okay language and I don't hate it. I worked for 10 years in Java, but at some point uh, it was simply misbehaving just because it doesn't force you to handle all the exceptions. And yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you said that the infrastructure with Beam and all these tools is working in, in Europe. Yes. To put it in, in several locations. Yes. How many people are working on this? Uh, how many developers are working on this uh, whole infrastructure project? Uh, it is 30 of us in our department, and then we have uh, some people in other. Uh, in Czechia, we have a few developers who work on Negotiator, but I think I only know three people. And uh, there was somebody in Austria. And yes, uh, Blaze, so the fire store is made by uh, Alex Kiel in Leipzig. So we do have some cooperators. If you look at the uh, sample, uh, the organizations the organization on GitHub, then you can probably see how many members there are, because not everybody is actually from our department there. Mm -hmm. But that's when it comes to IT, of course, uh, biobanks are run by their own people and they have their own administrators, because those administrators are not necessarily IT people. We have uh, all those operations uh, for installation of bridgehead. So the, let me just return to the, yes. Uh, so um, those blue rectangles that run on sites, they are called bridgeheads. Uh, and uh, we have simplified the installation process so that uh, if somebody who is just a, PhD student of biology is tasked with running it in a biobank. They can do that, of course. Uh, we have people who help them as well. So they're not on their own, but each biobank uh, has its own administrators. Yes. Mm -hmm. how, how open is the, the data on your, your portal? Is it, um, how can I apply for, for an account, let's say, to get uh, the further insights? So, do you need to be in? If... Oh, it is. I think if you, uh, if you have an account at a university, you should have the access. But not all the universities are there. Like, for example, I'm originally from Croatia and I couldn't find universities from there. So. I am more interested now in this rewriting you have from Java to Rust. <clears throat> Do you have some more number, for example, how big was Java? So how many lines of code? To, how long it took to change oh, to Rust? That's, that's complicated week, because yeah. Like uh, so I was t uh, actually because uh, there was uh, this Java uh, prototype of Focus, so to say, in but. It didn't have all those obfuscation uh, things inside. It didn't have a CQL uh, translation inside. It was only taking the tasks, running them against the Blaze store and returning them. So I had to rewrite it over a weekend because it was urgent. And I didn't see Rust before that, but okay, somehow managed to do it. And um, that was about a year ago and then we had uh, certain requirements because uh, in order to uh, go with the production, we needed to obfuscate the data, we needed to prevent CQL injections, and originally those uh, things were planned in Lens backend in the central component. Uh, so I considered it uh, safer to have it on site so that uh, non-obfuscated data never leaves the site and uh, so that the CQL is replaced at site. All the 
beam is safe, of course, but uh, with time I just started putting more and more uh, functionalities into focus. So right now it's not only task broker, it also does all those other things. So it would be a bit unfair to compare the lines of code because it has grown really a lot since the Java application. But you have a written central spot. So yeah, maybe okay. you can compare. Uh, but the thing is with central spot, it isn't really that complicated. It just gets an API request and like sends a beam task. And we have like a, also a Rust crate for interacting with uh, beam. So that was by using that, it was pretty simple. It's like only about maybe 200 lines of code or something. Um, but maybe, yeah, okay, there are some new feature requirements for it, but uh, then it will be a bit larger, but uh, like central spot is not really that big of an application. So that wasn't too difficult to rewrite. of about uh, 30 minutes and we get started with the next talk if you want to get to the restroom or get something else to drink or just talk about what you just heard maybe in person with Nola or each other uh, just for in between like to get an idea of uh, which social media channels actually work for this meetup uh, who of you uh, noticed the meetup on Mastodon <laughs> Who have you found out about it from friends or I don't know like people they talk they talked about it? Okay, so I have to find these people and see where they are, they heard about it. <laughs> Except for you, I can ask myself. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks a lot, and then let's have a break. Okay, let's get started with the second talk of this evening. I'm going to talk about Nix for monorepos. It's a bit of a, an overview of how we use Nix in our monorepository for development at Luger. It's also somehow giving a glimpse into using Nix at all, like the worst of both worlds, so you possibly learn nothing. Uh, no, hopefully I, uh, I get to spark your interest into checking Nix out if you haven't yet. And if you are using Nix, uh, maybe getting crazy into what kind of development setups you want to use Nix for. So first about me, I'm Niklas. I'm co-founder and tech lead at Aluga here from Mannheim. Uh, you can find me on the web at courts.dev. Also, since the last meetup, I finally become a Nix packages maintainer myself. For now, just two packages, but uh, slowly getting there. Um, I'm also a Rustation, so I enjoy programming in Rust whenever possible. And I run NixOS for fun on my own servers, my desktop, Raspberry Pi. I'm, ironically enough, not this laptop. This is a MacBook with macOS, but once as I Linux uh, reaches uh, Vulkan compliance, I'm going to at least put it on a second partition on my disk. So let's get started with uh, the motivation for this topic, like using Nix, using monorepositories, and more importantly, using Nix for monorepositories. Why would you want to use monorepositories at all? At Aluga, we originally started out with one Git repository per project. So for example, we had a web front end, we had an API server, then we introduced another service that did GraphQL on top of our API. We had a service that generates uh, streaming manifests because we do video streaming, and we also had a service that does background job processing for things like audio, video encoding and processing uh, and several other things. So at some point we noticed, okay, these are quite a few repositories. It's becoming really cumbersome to like do changes that spread among them and reviewing them and deploying them. So let's consolidate them all in one repository. And that also made it much easier for us to share code between these services, put them into extra packages and not having to host our own, for example, cargo or NPM package repository. Because they were all co-located in the same Git repository and more importantly, we knew everything uh, 
that is inside a comet, like the state of the repository, is more or less guaranteed to play nicely together. So monorepositories repositories are nice if you have the correct tooling and most people starting out with uh, monorepositories repositories do not have the correct tooling and it becomes quite hard to get into the topic of what is the good tooling for monorepositories, repositories and it becomes even harder if like us you have a repository that spreads, a more, uh, spreads out to more than one programming language. For example we are using Go, Rust and Node.js, a bit of Python too. If you're just using Node.js or just using Rust it's a lot easier to get started with modern repositories then in such a polyglot setup. So before Nix, our CI setup looked like this. We had about 1,000 lines of GitLab CI YAML code. Uh, 1,000 lines of programming uh, code in a programming language is not bad. It's perfectly fine to manage if you abstract and modulize it accordingly. But 1,000 lines of YAML configs is an absolute horror show to maintain and also to abstract. So, that also meant because we only wanted to build services that actually changed and you know service not only has to be rebuilt if itself its own source changes it also has to be rebuilt if a dependency of the service changes so we kind of tried to manage this with uh, filter based rules in the GitLab CI regular expressions that checked okay if these paths with these uh, um, wildcards change then the service has to be rebuilt etc and that worked okay most of the time until it doesn't because at some point you're going to end up uh, not rebuilding a service that needs to be rebuilt or rebuilding lots of services that actually did not change at all. So at the core of the CI setup was Docker. We had about 17 Docker files, some of those base images uh, for sharing code between our services and mostly one Docker file per service. Now how does Rust play into this? The name of Rust, uh, not Rust, how does Nix, sorry, play into this? The name of Nix is really confusing because it means multiple things. It's a package manager, build tool, a functional programming language. And if you add Nix OS into the mix, it also is a Linux distribution based on the Nix functional programming language and package manager. If you've never tried out Nix, uh, maybe check out zero to nixcom That's a pretty nice guide for modern Nix usage, like with Flakes, et cetera, that people warn you about or tell you that you should only use fl uh, Flakes. In the end, use something, see if it works for you, and then continue from there. And Nix not only is a package manager, it also, of course, to be useful, has a package repository behind it. And this is not only a really large package repository, but it has a lot of up-to-date packages. If you compare these numbers to Debian and Ubuntu, Debian and Ubuntu have about 20,000 packages. And what's important, they're all up-to-date in terms of security patches. I'm pretty sure the 20,000 also references that. It doesn't mean that you get the latest feature release, but that you have an up-to-date, secure version of your packages. Uh, but it's still not nearly as, as much as you have in Nix packages. And then you have something like the Arch user repository. The Arch user repository actually has almost as many packages as Nix packages, but only a third of those are up-to-date. So if you are using AUR, you're very likely to run into an out-of-date package that is missing security updates or might be completely unmaintained. And in Nix packages, you probably will end up with the correct up-to-date package. So since switching our CI setup to Nix, we have 1,000 lines of Nix code instead of 1,000 lines of YAML code. Uh, you might perhaps think, okay, so what did you actually gain from this? But the thing is, Nix is a functional programming language. It is not a weirdly defined config language that has uh, parsing caveats that don't work the same in all libraries like YAML. So you're able to abstract things in the setup. You can say I have an abstraction, a function that is just for building Go projects. I have an abstraction for building Rust projects. I have an abstraction for making images out of these packages, etc. And that's what we're doing. So. Uh, but all of this still needs some glue code. Uh, we have Python scripts that interact with Nix based on, on its JSON output, do things like decide, okay, we have to deploy this. Uh, we have to um, check if the cache is up to date for this, etc. But all of this is getting really easy thanks to what Nix already delivers us. And what Nix does deliver is fine-grained build caching. The thing with Nix is that uh, Nix knows, based on the inputs it gets, if a package is up to date or not. And it does this by calculating the, ha the hashes of the inputs a package gets. It's a bit more complicated uh, with the discussion of content addressed, addressed hashing, but we're not going to dive into that here. So let's just talk about input addressed hashing. So that means if you have, for example, a C library 
deep down in your dependency tree, like glibc and this changes, its own hash changes. And from there on, the hashes of all libraries or programs depending on glibc hash, uh, hashes change. So Nix knows, okay, I have to rebuild all of these. And our Python scripts knows, okay, this library deep down in the dependency tree changed. All of these packages of Aluga have to be rebuilt because the input hash has changed. And that got rid of our hacky change detection, which was using path-based filtering in GitLab, and became a lot more reliable. So how do we build packages in Nix? Let's get started with a rather easy example, and probably one of the most common ones you encounter when getting started with Nix, which is standard env.make derivation. If you look at this example, you might be confused by the syntax a bit. I know that I struggled for at least one or two months with probably understanding Nix code because it somehow did not get into my head how this works. I was completely unfamiliar with functional programming languages, so there's that. Um, but what we see here to break it down a bit is make derivation is a function like you have in any other programming language. And we're calling this function with an attribute set. Attribute sets are what you call like dictionaries or hash maps in Nix, and this attribute set contains the parameters we pass to the make derivation function. We say my package is uh, called my CPP program, and the source code for this package lies in the source directory uh, relative to the, the location of my Nix config. Uh, I have a build script. It's an easy, basic C++ program. I'm just going to invoke the C++ compiler and output a build artifact, my CPP program. And then finally, in the install phase of my package, I'm moving this binary artifact to the output of my package, and Nix knows how to continue from there. Like, it hashes the input, which is my source. Takes in, in that case, it takes the file hashes of the input source files, which is just main CPP in this case. And then, whenever anything in the source directory changes, the hash of my package changes, and Nix knows, OK, my CPP program has to be rebuilt. And anything referencing my CPP program, for example, a container that wraps this binary, needs to be rebuilt as well. Now at the Luger, we don't actually write C or C++ code. As I said, we have Go, Rust, and Node.js code, and a bit of Python. So instead, let's just build a Go program. Now, the nice thing about Nix packages is, I just mentioned, it has 60,000 up-to-date packages. But Nix packages basically also functions as a kind of standard library for writing your own Nix packages. It has built functions for C, C++ programs, and also for Go, Python, Haskell, Node.js, etc. Any popular programming language, I'm going to make that thesis here, is eventually going to end up as a build function in Nix packages, making it much easier to get started with Nix for your own projects. One thing that's different from our previous example, two things actually, first of all, you see this new parameter build inputs here. Our package depends on other packages inside Nix packages. One is ohm, one is libsignal ffi, one is a C library, the other is a Rust library. We don't have to care about this in our package definition because it is abstracted away in the package definition of these packages. We don't have to care about that when we use it. So unlike uh, when you're regularly using C Go, like Go that references C libraries, you might struggle with, okay, how, where do I get these libraries from? Am I going to install them from apt, from brew if I'm on macOS? Am I going to fetch them by source and build them myself? Don't worry about it with Nix. Nix has you covered. And finally, the other parameter you notice is vendor hash. Uh, another attribute of Nix is that builds are fully isolated, asterisk, you can still access the system time, which makes them not fully isolated, unfortunately. But they cannot access files outside their build or output directory. They cannot access the network, etc. That means if you want to fetch in packages or dependencies, as is often the case for Go, that are not inside Nix packages, you still need network access. And you can do that with fixed output derivations. So by supplying a hash here, the build go module function is allowed to make network requests internally under one condi condition. Build go module fetches the dependencies of my go module as defined in my dependencies, then hashes all of the contents that it's fetched. And only if this matches the hash I have defined in my package definition, then the build can continue. And also, that get, gets us back to the build caching, if Nix already has this hash, this go module hash stored inside its Nix store, 
it doesn't have to re-download it again. It knows, okay, this is exactly the same because it has this file hash. I can use this for building this package. I can avoid further network requests. As you can see, I said uh, we have uh, non-go dependencies here, libsignal ffi. That's actually a Rust package. So if you look into this, it's going to look something like this. Again, the Nix standard library, Nix packages standard library has us covered with the build Rust package function. And one major difference of this to uh, the example we saw on the previous slide is we are not, we're not setting a hash here. So this still has to fetch cargo dependencies for our Rust program. How does it do that? We can also, depending on the function that Nix packages has or that we are writing ourselves, we can fetch URLs ourselves and work with that. We can analyze the contents of cargo.log, which is the log file for Rust projects, and use the hashes that it defines itself there. That completely avoids the need to manually update the vendor hash as we just had with build go, mod go module. And because Rust automatically updates the log file whenever we change our dependencies, we're worry-free. Perfect. So, but as I said, we can also write our own abstractions or use the community's extra abstractions. One of these is cargo to Nix, which uh, analyzes cargo.log as well, but does a few more things. What it does, it creates a graph of the dependencies, including the crates that are inside your Rust workspace. That makes it perfect for using it in monorepos. For example, if you have two Rust services with some shared code that depend on this and you only want this shared crate that is part of your own repository to be built once, and then reuse that build artifact for building the other services, that's possible with cargo to Nix. Just call the function, make package set. In this case, we tell it use the latest Rust version. We also supply it with this cargo.nix file that is auto-generated by cargo to Nix. And it gives us an attribute set called Rust packages where we can access the crates defined in our workspace and build them directly. Uh, one thing that might be unclear right now is, okay, build them directly. What does that look like? So let me just go back a few slides because I skipped that one. This is a really simplified view of what it looks like, but with Nix flakes, you just call Nix build, then you supply the location of the flake you want to build. In that case, it's the current directory, hence the dot. Then you put the hash symbol and the package name, and then Nix does whatever is defined inside your own package definition, inside the package definitions that it depends on, etc. And it also automatically fetches anything that's already available in binary caches that you have defined. For example, the predefined official Nix packages cache to avoid rebuilding any packages that are already cached. And then it links the output to a result directory. We can inspect the contents and we see, okay, this is a normal Mac OS binary. Um, I haven't mentioned this at the start, but Nix works really fine, not only on Linux and Nix OS, but on Mac OS as well, and more or less on FreeBSD too. So, uh, we have talked about building. What benefits did changing our setup to Nix bring to our build process? Um, first of all, as I said, we have a lot of uh, already predefined ways to build packages in the Nix packages repository. It's not only a package repository, it functions as a standard library. But if these are insufficient, we can either write our own abstractions because Nix is a functional programming language, or we can use the Nix communities one, like cargo to Nix in the previous slide. Also, we get build isolation, and from that, hash addressed caching, because we can be sure, despite the thing with the system time, that the output of a Nix build will be the same, depending on uh, if the inputs are the same. And finally, we can push, and pu uh, push to and pull from binary caches. The largest one is the official Nix packages binary cache, but you can also host your own binary cache, for example, using Attic, or uh, pay someone to do it for you using Cachex. And that's it for building with Nix. I've also mentioned uh, deployments and containers. That's what we're going to look at next. So in Aluga, we, have, we still have about 15, I think at this, uh, this point it's a bit more, um, Docker images, or let's call them OCI images because we took Docker out of the equation, that we are deploying to a Kubernetes cluster. And what's really nice is, while our development and CI setup was changed to Nix, nothing changed about our ops setup. We are running a Kubernetes cluster for our services that just pulls in the OCI images as it did before, and basically it doesn't care about the change from Docker to Nix because from its end it's the same. So how does our pipeline work now in a summary? We first check which of our Nix packages are cached. 
based on the, the information that Nix provides from its own Nix store and our upstream Nix binary cache that we are hosting ourselves. Then we are rebuilding the images that are uncached, like images that depend on the packages that have to be rebuilt. And then we push these newly built images to our container registry. And from there on, it's normal OCI or Docker image usage as you're already used to, if you're used to Docker, that is. We had at the beginning the example of this My Go program. If you would build this in a Docker file, as we did before switching to Nix, you would start out with a base image. For example, because you're building a Docker uh, file for Go, you would start out with the Go ba Golang base image. Then you're just copying in your source code, quite similar to what we did with the Go package at the beginning. Then you're running Go mod download to get the dependencies, and then you're building go your Go program mods. Perfectly simple, but except for one detail, we're depending on a Rust library, or maybe something more exotic, who knows? So how would we accomplish this in, go, uh, in Docker? You would have to either uh, resort to multi-stage Docker files, like have another stage that depends on the Rust base image. Then you would uh, build the Rust, uh, the libsignal library there, copy it over, mm -hmm. and potentially run into the issue that you did not cop copy everything over from that other stage. Or the other option would be to like, I don't know, uh, host the binary artifact of lib libsignal FFI uh, built from a, diff a different CI pipeline, but that again makes things a lot more complicated if you want to update it. Let's instead look at how would you define a Docker or OCI image in Nix. Much easier because we're taking the build process of, out of the equation. We already wrote our package definition. We don't care about how this package is built when we're building the container image. That also means you can share re responsibilities one person can be responsible for building packages, writing the package definitions. The other can be the expert for OCI images and deployments. And it, they just have to reference the Nix package that the other person wrote and be done with it. It outputs a binary. My Docker image imp, uh, embeds this binary and runs it. Perfect. Now, a problem with this approach, and also one of the reasons I don't like the upstream Docker tools, although they're perfectly fine for getting started, all of this puts everything in your Docker image in one layer. If you're familiar with Docker layers, that means that uh, every time you change something about your container, the whole container gets re-downloaded. What you can do against that is we can split our image up into layers and we're much more flexible at it than the Docker file is. If we go back to the Docker file, every step in my Docker file creates a new layer and Eventually, we end up at a limit of 128 layers because that's the ma maximum an OCI image can contain. And furthermore, they are all linear, unless you're using multi-stage builds. But for simplicity, let's use this example. They're all linear. So if I change something about this stage, then everything beyond it has to be rebuilt as well because Docker does not know if it depends on it or not. Just has to think that it does. With Nix, Nix has the full dependency graph, knows what a package depends on. So if, for example, we change something about libsignal FFI or glibc in these layers here, only that part gets rebuilt unless the other library or package depends on this package as well. And we have the flexibility to say which of these dependencies should be put together in the same layer. So if that's interesting to you, fine-grained graph-based uh, layer management for Docker images, definitely check out Nix to container. Now we're already at the end of my talk. Uh, I have a few articles that I can recommend to, uh, to you if this like sparked your interest in using Nix for building your monorepos or even any repository because monorepos is just a catchphrase here. It works for anything. The first is, as I, uh, as I said, zero to Nix if you're just getting started with Nix. Uh, at the end, you will have a link to the PDF then you can click these links. So if you're confused that they're blue and you can't click in from your seat, wait a moment. Um, if you are building Rust projects and have like multiple crates in the same repository, have a look at the article building Nix Flex from Rust Workspaces that also addresses cargo to Nix, which we are using. If you have Go projects, have a look at announcing Go mod to Nix by Adam Hoes. And finally, if you're interested in building images that are deployed to Kubernetes, have a look at Luke Perkins' article deploying Nix build containers to Kubernetes. Finally, very fitting. Uh, last week at NixCon NA, Ziyazo held a talk about Nix is a better Docker image builder than Docker's image builder, and I fully agree to that. Definitely have a look at that because it's much more detailed than what I could address in this talk. 
And from there on, if you're interested in what I have shown you about fine-grained management of Docker image layers using Nix, read the article Nix Docker Layer Explicitly with uh, Out Duplicate Packages by Peter Koloch. And hopefully soon on my own blog, you will get a detailed article about the topics I uh, address in this talk. So if you have any questions, you can download my talk at dl.courts.dev slash meetup minus dash nix dash monorepos.pdf. You can also contact me on Matrix or Mastodon or by email. And of course, ask here right now. Um, with regards to, to Nix being a better uh, image builder than, uh, than Docker, um, I can, can imagine that that's true. <laughs> um, how is your build setup designed? Are you building on a operating system installed on a physical host, or are you maybe even building inside a container running the Nix image, the container using Nix? So we've gone through multiple stages. That's a very good question. What we started out with was uh, we copied what we already had from our Docker setup, and that used uh, auto-scaling on a Kubernetes cluster where it ran, first it ran Docker with socket forwarding, then it ran rootless Docker. We also played around with buildkit, etc. cetera. Uh, then we copied that approach for Nix. What we noticed was that although we have this build cache now, and it's a, uh, well, in that case, it was not co-located with the VMs that were running in the cluster. That was one issue, but we didn't fix it. So <laughs> can't tell you if it works better. But it still had the issue that our uh, pipelines had to pull all these already built artifacts from our binary cache. Then what we did next, we, put a, we got two persistent machines where we put the CI runners on, first in containers. Uh, that worked reasonably well, uh, and at some point, we migrated these uh, machines completely over to NixOS. And then we didn't see a point in using the containers anymore <laughs> because we already had Nix running on there. Uh, the containers, um, we used the, I think we used the official Nix con Docker containers. Uh, it was a bit finicky with forwarding like the cache uh, that it doesn't get re removed when you upgrade the uh, Docker image. Like, of course, you, have to, you need a volume, but this volume needs the according permissions because Nix store has to be read-only except for the Nix user. It works eventually. It's not as uh, streamlined as a setup as you directly have on NixOS, but it works. Thanks. Perfectly following to that question, um, I'm there is a book called Nixos Introduction. I'm not sure whether you know it. I, I know it. I keep checking it out whenever I get an email. It has been updated. Yeah, I know. And I'm like, <laughs> I already read it. Okay, I don't have time to read it right, right um, now. <laughs> but why are you... I mean, you could also, along the same lines as what you talked about just right now, um, skip Docker containers overall and only use Nixos machines. That we done, I don't know. That's correct. Terraform. So there are two reasons against it. First of all, we already had to set up. That's why I said the nice thing is we can exchange our development setup and our ops setup is completely unconcerned by it. That makes the migration so much easier. And that's actually also one point that Z addressed in their talk last week. Uh, the other is NixOS does not replace Kubernetes, at least not yet. Like what we achieve with Kubernetes is uh, we have pod affinities, we have auto scaling, we have networking. All of that is possible with NixOS in a cluster but also it's not, it's not automated the way it is in Kubernetes. Some smart people took care of that already. I'm going to use their work. And if someone does the same for NixOS, then I might look into it. But one thing that I thought about mentioning in the further reading, there is the Nix Snapshotter project. And what that does is it makes you use Nix store paths as container images. Like it hooks into your container runtime and then you can just supply a Nix store path in Kubernetes, for example, in your manifest, and then it thinks that's an OCI image, but in the end, it's just a Nix derivation that it starts. It's probably quite similar to the hacks you see with deploying WebAssembly builds on Kubernetes clusters. Yeah. Behind first? Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I meant you. <laughs> because oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, maybe the wrong place for this question, but um, how is it with Java program? Is there also some Nix uh, support, you know? So yes, 
because they, believe it or not, there are many Java pro programs people use daily, so they are already included in Nix packages. And to be able to include a package in Nix package, you first have to write a function that builds this programming language. So it's able to build Java projects. Uh, I think uh, last week in some uh, conversation, I heard that it's a bit problem problematic with Gradle projects right now but it should work fine with Maven. I personally am not a Java developer, so I don't know how true that is. Maybe it's related to the prob a problem of uh, hashing addresses in, uh, your, in your dependency management. But it should be possible. Oh, cool. Um, you, um, a bit of a bit unrelated to Nix, maybe, um, but it goes in the direction of your monorepo setup. Um, from my experience, um, mono setup are sometimes used as an excuse for not doing proper dependency management. Um, as, you, as you say, probably it's like the proper tooling um, is allowed and so on. Um, how is it working with, um, with your setup on production? So at some point you need to deploy your... So, so you basically have one commit hash, or one commit over the whole repository, and you know this version is, or all the components are compatible with right. each other. And on deployment, we is always, it to, to worry yeah. that you do not communicate with an old version of your, your app, right? We always deploy the whole state of a commit to production. That way we know that, I mean, of course, uh, what we don't have right now is, uh, um, we're using just, uh, for example, if, you, if your pod is getting scaled down and you might have the problem that one comes up earlier than the other, but you can get around that with health checks. Um, yeah, basically we're tagging all images at the same time to production, then we are using the, uh, the hash addressed uh, version of Docker images like at SHA256 with the hash of the image we pushed to our container registry and then deploy the whole state of uh, the current production branch at once. Okay, but, but, but if, if you have um, requests throughout the whole process, right, then, then you have some parts of this, so I'm just guessing that you have a microservices set up, so you have multiple deployments in Kubernetes terms probably yep. um, running alongside each other, uh, which doing rolling deployments or whatever. and. Um, is it, is it possible that, that one system comes up first, maybe, because it's faster in downloading yeah, the images and then communicate with an old version and corrupt the state, potentially? I mean, you will have probably solved that issue uh, somehow, but... So, uh, I, I think the, the honest truth is, for example, we also deploy my, um, database migrations as uh, containers. And when that ran and you still have a service running that's incompatible with that, it will error for a few seconds. Okay, okay. So, we haven't solved it that fine-grained. Okay, but you're tolerating the errors then basically. Yeah, I mean, that that's also a good, good way to handle it, yeah. It doesn't corrupt our data. It might be inconvenient if you're the user at the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. But so far, it didn't cause any issues. Okay, yeah, thanks for the insights. It's interesting how, how that's solved amongst <laughs> different services. Cool. Yeah, maybe some related question. Um, if I like to, to refactor my company's um, Git, and uh, think now monorepo is cool. Um, how do you structure? Do you have, is it sensible of to have one big monorepo for everything what you have in the company, even if it's not related, or is it, or you have some like you have it, uh, some cluster um, of microservices that are fitting together in one monorepo, but you have other repos yeah. for for other stuff. Yeah, we, we have the latter. So where we primarily have right now, we have the Aluga monorepo. Uh, then we also have a repo for like some ops related stuff that's called server tools. I think it's our oldest still active repository. Uh, we have one that's concerned with machine learning and Python stuff that does not de get deployed, but is only relevant for research. Uh, we don't put that in the monorepository because it's irrelevant for our usual deployment, de um, deployment workflow. And we also currently, I'm not sure if that's going to change, but we currently have the NixOS configurations for the NixOS machines we're running in a separate repository. But there again, it's all in the same repository. So I think it doesn't make sense to like, concern yourself 
do these things have to work uh, together? Are people going to develop on them at the same time? In that case, you would like to co-locate code review. For example, have one pull request contain all the changes at once that are related to a project or a change, even if that concerns more than one service that you're going to deploy. Always depends on the case. But then again, there are companies like Microsoft, Meta, and Google. They just put everything in one monorepo, so that exists too. But uh, it also ends up. This looks, this, uh, I read about this and I was wondering how you can put one repo for everything in such a company, yes? That creates completely different problems. For example, Microsoft's repository. I think they may be not putting everything in one uh, rep uh, repository, but everything Windows related is one repository and this has more than 300 gigabytes of size, of size. That's not something Git can handle. So what they did, they wrote a file system driver that mounts a Git repository inside Windows. So you don't have to pull the whole repository at once. I'm not sure if that's the right solution. <laughs> I think it's, it's uh, you heard something similar with, uh, is it Google who's using Garrett? I think they also yeah. have something in yeah. place that you can just have portions of the repo. Yeah, they have like these, uh, these uh, deployment tools, uh, depot tools it's called. I think that's what Chromium uses. And at least for me when working with these, in my spare time, it also is something that uh, makes me consider, tries, do I actually want to look into this? The 300 gigabytes are like the state or, of, of one commit or the whole no, Git repo? I'm pretty sure it's the state of one commit. <laughs> <laughs> it's different, for example, if you have Nix packages, is really large. Uh, in terms of a Git repository already because it has a lot of history, like Nix started out in 24 and maybe uses Git for more than 15 years now, something like that. And that's why it has about four gigabytes of size, but, or maybe even more, I'm not sure. Maybe I didn't pull the whole history, but like the single state of one commit in Nix packages is about 35 megabytes. Mm -hmm. and that is something you can work with, while 320 gigabytes requires whole new technological solutions for the problem. Okay, and then I think that's all. Thank you a lot for listening. I would be happy to see some or all of you on the next meetup on April 29 in Heidelberg again. I will announce it on every channel that I announced this one on. So for those of you who only heard about it from friends, maybe check out those channels or ask them if they heard it on those channels. <laughs> uh, yeah, and now for whoever wants to stay and like talk about Nix, Rust, etc., feel free to engage. <laughs>